Hi, my name is Alejandro Jimena Restrepo and welcome to our International Virtual EP Talks 2020. This is a pre-recorded session uh, with Dr. Martin K. Stiles, who is Director of Electrophysiology at Waikato Hospital and Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Auckland. He chaired the recent focus update to the 2015 Expert Consensus Statement on Optimal ICD Programming and Testing and is uh, discussing in this video evidence-based ICD programming. Some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, we had bradycardia recommendations, but we specifically excluded uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy pacing because um, um, that was felt to be beyond the uh, remit of the topic. And we did tachycardia detection recommendations. That was my section. Um, and uh, we did tachycardia therapy recommendations. That was Bruce Wilkoff's section. And um, Carlos Murillo, uh, who was representing Latin American Heart Rhythm Society, talked about DFT testing, which I'm not going to cover today because we're talking about programming rather than the DFT testing. Um, and these were the, so this is the recommendations for uh, pacing. There were a couple of class one recommendations. There were several class 2A recommendations. I'm just going to briefly mention the class one recommendations. I'm, I don't want you to read that. I just want you to show, see that, see what they were. So. Um, we had a class one recommendation with the level of evidence at uh, BR, meaning that there's some randomized data, but not a lot. Um, so in ICD patients who also have sinus node disease and guideline supported indications for a bradycardia pacemaker, it's um, beneficial to provide dual chamber pacing to reduce the risk of AF and stroke, to avoid pacemaker syndrome and to improve quality of life. So in single or dual chamber ICD patients without guideline supported indications for bradycardia pacing, Adjusting the pacing parameters is recommended so that ventricular stimulation, stimulation is min minimized with the aim of improving survival and reducing heart failure hospitalization. So those were our two class one recommendations. One, if you've got a um, sick sinus syndrome, sinus node disease, we really want to provide them with a dual chamber pacing. And, uh, but if you don't have any indication of bradycardia pacing, um, we want to use a single chamber ICD. Or if you're going to have a dual chamber ICD, we want to set it so that ventricular stimulation is stimulation. <laughs> stimulation is minimized uh, to get uh, improved survival and reduce heart failure hospitalization. So um, the RV pacing uh, issue is, I'm just going to move my, yeah. sorry, I'm just, can't see my own screen. Good, I can now. So um, the percent RV pacing has been um, uh, a study uh, there was a landmark analysis from the David trial. So primary outcome was death and heart failure hospitalization. And you can see from this that percent RV pacing was predictive um, of the primary endpoint after adjustment for a number of things. So if you have a VVI pacemaker where you're basically unpaced, this is the primary endpoint here. And if you have a, a dual chamber pacemaker where the pacing is over 40% in the ventricle, then the primary endpoint is more likely to occur. Whereas if you have a dual chamber pacemaker where somehow, whether during the patient, because of the patient's own physiology or the programming settings that you've done, the pacing is less than 40%, then the, the outcomes mirror that of the unpaced BVI. And so previously when we thought that maybe dual chamber pacing would be good, in fact, we found it to be de deleterious or at least the RV pacing percentage is deleterious. And if you look at long-term uh, follow-up, so this is an eight-year follow-up of the MATA2 study. So the MATA2 study looking at patients who received an ICD or did not receive an ICD, I, I'm not sure where the, the, where the um, outcome was reported. I'm suspecting around the two-year mark here where you can see there's a clear difference. But if you go on to look at these patients over, over eight years, you can see that the dual chambers, uh, the, the um, mortality tends to veer away from the single chamber ICD. Now there may be selection bias here, the reasons for the dual chamber, maybe the sicker patients and that sort of thing, but at least part of it we know from the other studies is due to the likelihood of dual chamber pacemakers um, uh, promoting right ventricular pacing and, and this is not necessarily a good thing. And then you've got to think yourself, well, if we're talking about ICDs, how common is a new pacing indication? So, you know, there's, a, there's been a study here from uh, four centers where, you know, about 10% have an indication of implant, the sinus node disease or complete heart block, they need a pacemaker. But additionally, uh, at one year, just half a percent of those patients had an additional pacing indication. Uh, and you've got this randomized control here of 100 people where they had a single or a dual chamber ICD and just one patient uh, crossed over 
from a single to a dual chamber ICD after 45 months because they developed complete heart block. And then you can look at subcutaneous ICD data, so nearly 900 patients who underwent subcutaneous ICD. Uh, many of these patients, well, all of these patients, because of the nature of the device, did not receive need pacing in the beginning. And just 0.3% or three devices uh, were replaced uh, in that nearly two year follow up period because of the need for right ventricular pacing. So, in actual fact, a new pacing indication turns out to be really not that common. And then, if you look at the complications, of a single chamber versus dual chamber ICD is really can be quite compelling data. So um, you can see here from this meta-analysis that in actual fact, there's a relative risk of 1.83, meaning that you're 1.83 times more likely to get a complication from your defibrillator if it's dual chamber than if it's VVI. And there's no difference in all cause mortality, so it's not killing the patients, but on the other hand, the dual chamber devices are not uh, saving the patients either. And there's no difference in inappropriate therapy. Uh, does someone want to mute that phone? Uh, uh, Aleander is a host. I think one of the most useful things I found when I'm hosting these things for students is the ability to mute all. <laughs> um, thanks. So, um, so there's more complications with it with, it, with another lead. Um, so, any and, the, and if you look at 100,000 registry uh, devices, so this is you know powerful data. And nearly two thirds dual chamber, which which I think speaks volumes in itself that more dual chamber devices being put in than are really needed. The complications are 3% for the dual chamber and 2% for the single chamber. And in fact, even in hospital mortality is higher for the dual chamber. Now, the, this is a registry data, so you've got to think about the selection biases and that sort of stuff. But I think um, one of the things we can conclude is that, you know, it's important to manage lead problems for ICD recipients. recipients. And firstly, one should only implant as many leads as are really needed. If you get more leads, you get more problems, you get more implant complications, you get more failures, you get more pacing. And in fact, the dual chamber devices tend to have less battery life, uh, even at, at factory settings. Just one brief mention about how you might get dual chamber functionality or some of the features of dual chamber functionality uh, without implanting an additional lead. So this is a biotronic system, which is effectively like a BDD pacemaker. Some of you may remember the BDD pacemaker. So you've got a single lead here, and it's a defibrillator lead into the coil, the pace sense portion. And instead of having a coil, a proximal coil, what they've done is they've used that to put a floating dipole here that sits against hopefully the, left, the right atrial wall. You can't pace from this, so you don't get atrial pacing. But what you do get is atrial sensing. And if you think about why you might want an atrial lead in the defibrillator, it's probably because of atrial sensing, right? And so you can see here that you can get information that might help you with SVT discriminators or, or, or reasons for tachycardia um, that could be useful. So just to bear that in mind that maybe there is a sort of a halfway house here between putting two leads and putting a BDD type uh, ICD lead. Now let's move on to my section. I, I don't expect you to, to, to read that. I'm, I'm, inclined to quickly rip past this book in case you start to try and read it. But just to say that with the tachycardia detection recommendations, we had the most recommendations. We had 15 recommendations, five class one, five two A's, and five two B's. Some of them are pretty small print, and I'm not gonna talk about these things, uh, you know, about morphology templates and that sort of stuff. I'm gonna quickly go past them. The major part of it is about detection intervals, detection rates, but uh, before I do that, and while we're talking about lead complications, I just want to dismiss some of the lead-related recommendations in this section. So we've decided that it was uh, recommended to activate lead failure alerts to detect potential lead problems um, because these are useful. And we had a class one recommendation, lots of non-randomized registry data to tell you this is useful. Just to reiterate, in this section, we said it's reasonable to choose a single chamber ICD therapy in preference to dual chamber ICD therapy if the sole reason for the atrial lead is SVT discrimination. Unless you've got a known SVT, which you know may enter the BT treatment zone. And the aim of this recommendation for a single chamber ICD was to reduce the lead related complications and the cost of ICD therapies. Dual chamber devices being more expensive uh, with additional lead and the device itself. And most importantly, the life of the device is less. We thought it's useful as a class 2B CEO, that's the lightest recommendation you can really give, to activate lead noise algorithms, which might withhold shocks when detected BF is not confirmed on a far field channel, uh, because we want to avoid therapies for non-physiological signals. What we're saying here is that noise algorithms are useful for reducing um, 
inappropriate shocks. And a very small print one about the sensing vector, if you've got the opportunity to uh, move the sensing, ve sensing vector from bipolar to integrated bipolar, um, and that may help in leads that are at risk for the failure of the cable to ring electro. But really what we're saying is this is not intended as a long-term solution when you've identified a cable fracture, but it can buy you some time uh, to get around to remedying it and the patient's at least risk of inappropriate shock during that time. All right, so I guess this is really where we get into the main part of what we're talking about with ICD programming. Um, you know, they talk about people standing on the shoulders of giants, and I think really when you're writing expert consensus statements, before you start thinking about writing expert consensus statement, you're gonna say, well, you know, am I going to have data to back up the recommendations I'm going to make? And in this case, we had these five really good studies that we were able to do, the provide study, the prepare, prepare study, the made at IRT study, the relevant trial, and the advanced three trial. So using these trials, we were then able to say, well, you know, when we're making recommendations, we can back it up with evidence to say we're doing the right thing. I want to talk about this slide, which is kind of an interesting thing, I think, to make as a starting point when you're talking about these things. So these are old trials, right? What we're trying to show here is the, the appropriate therapy response. So looking at the AVID trial, very high risk patients, more than 60% of them received uh, appropriate therapy during the trial time. However, in the control group, and the control group did not receive an ICD, the mortality is about half. So clearly, not all shocks given appropriately were saving the life, because if that was true, you'd expect the mortality to be similar. Moreover, you'd expect the sudden death mortality to be similar. So, and we don't have sudden death for all the trials, but where we do, that's indicated in the light blue bars here. So you can see that people are getting more appropriate therapy than the control group is getting either mortality or sudden death. So that tells you two things. Either not all those ventricular arrhythmias were gonna go and kill the patient, some of them would have terminated themselves, or possibly that the ICD itself is giving them VT. And that's actually an important point because there are situations where you get the short, long, short set up by a pacing algorithm that can actually give you VT. I think that's just important to remember. But I think the majority of it is that the VT that the is being treated here is not necessarily going to kill the patient. And maybe it's going to self-terminate. Maybe we can wait. So I'm not going to go through all the trials. Big sigh of relief from everybody. <laughs> but uh, I would want to go through that made at RIT trial just as an explanation of how these trials were designed. And many of you will be familiar with them. I'm sorry if I'm going over old ground, but I mean, you know, it's worthwhile. This is now uh, 2012 work. So we have the conventional way of programming. Conventionally, ICDs were put in to shock people, right? You had the AVID trial, you had a very high risk population. There was a, a, a desire to prevent people from sudden cardiac death. So you set the thing with a hair trigger. So over 170 beats per minute, you wait for two and a half seconds. You have a few detections on, like onset stability. You give a bit of ATP and you shock the patient. If the enhancements tell you to withhold therapy, the sustained rate duration only withhold therapy for three minutes, and then it'll shock disregarding the SVT discriminators. If you go over 200 beats per minute, it's even simpler. They get a shot of ATP, they get shocked, and they only have a one second delay. So that's our conventional arm. And I think that's probably reflective of how many of these uh, devices came out of the box. In contrast, the high rate arm decided anything at 170 beats per minute is going to be monitor only. We're not going to treat that. But if it goes over 200 beats per minute, you're going to get a slightly longer delay, two and a half seconds versus one second. You're going to get one crack at ATP and shocks. So simply, you're just going to raise the threshold for intervention. And arm C was duration delay. So they decided, well, we are going to treat patients with VT more than 170 beats per minute, but we're going to wait for 60 seconds before doing so. We're going to have some enhancements like rhythm ID. We're going to have a shot at ATP, and we're actually going to trust our enhancements, our rhythm ID. We're going to turn sustained rate duration off. So we're going to say, if the machine thinks it's SVT, we're going to trust it. Then in zone two, if it went over 200 beats per minute, instead of waiting 60 seconds or two and a half or one second, you're going to wait for 12 seconds. You're going to have your enhancement on, you get a shot at ATP, a shot, sustained rate duration off. And then if it's really fast, 250 beats per minute, you're going to give a two and a half second delay and get into it. So that's the, the, the background here. What's the results? Well, the primary outcome was inappropriate therapy, first occurrence of inappropriate therapy. And you can see here, 
that over time, after a couple of years, you're getting up to 30% of inappropriate therapy in the conventional arm. Whereas in arm B and arm C, you're really minimizing it to around the 5% mark. So five times reduction on inappropriate therapy for high rate, four times reduction on inappropriate therapy for delayed. So either strategy is reasonable, both are effective. Now I think what surprised me and certainly probably surprised or delighted perhaps the investigators is not only was the primary endpoint down, but mortality was down. And then when you think about that, that's really interesting. You're gonna shock the patients less and they're gonna survive longer. So here we have the conventional therapy. Uh, here you can see mortality rising over the study period to about 10% after two years. Uh, and it sticks around the sort of 5% mark here for the delayed therapy and high rate therapy, such that the made RID programming, um, B or C, resulted in a 50% reduction in total mortality. So just think about that again. You're gonna shock the patients less by either letting lower rates go through or waiting for the thing to self-terminate. Before you, sh before you shock the patient. And by doing so, you're actually reducing the number of patients who die. So I said I wasn't gonna go through all the studies. I'm not, but I am gonna go through this meta-analysis. Um, this is all the studies I talked about, Imperial Prepare, Prepare Relevant, made at RIT, both arms, advanced three provide. The bottom line here is that all these, fa these therapies favor a therapy, of, uh, a therapy reduction programming. So we're talking about waiting. Therapy reduction versus conventional programming and the risk of death, right? Um, so therapy reduction programming results in a large, significant, consistent reduction in mortality. So when you're talking about optimal taking detection parameters for ICD patients, uh, you know, Voltaire, who lived a long time ago, uh, suggested, um, I'm sorry, it's not the original French, but the art of medicine consists in amusing the patient while nature cures the disease. And you can say, well, you know, that was, that was a long time ago when there were not a lot of options for curing diseases. But in fact, you know, it's quite relevant even today. So if therapy is treatment intended to cure a disorder, then in fact, time is therapy. If we simply wait before intervening with a potentially harmful therapy, then I think that is a useful therapy in itself. I don't know if that's a stretch for some of you, but I, I, I believe that um, we can demonstrate safety uh, here, and it's a safe thing to do. So here's the tachycardia detection section recommendations. So class one recommendations, level of evidence A. I'm not gonna read it, you'll be able to read it for yourself. I'm just gonna take you through uh, this uh, slide by slide uh, on this. So this is a level of evidence A for primary prevention patients. All these studies are pretty much done in primary prevention ICD patients because there's large numbers of them, and you can people feel more comfortable about altering um, uh, settings in patients who haven't actually had the problem yet. But if we look at secondary prevention patients, in fact, we also have a class one recommendation, but the level of evidence drops down to uh, randomized trial evidence, but slight randomized trial evidence because we're talking about a subset of one trial. So the advanced three trial did have a significant subset of secondary prevention patients. And the critical part of this particular recommendation is that we're going to require the tachycardia to continue for at least six to 12 seconds or for 30 intervals before starting to get into therapy. Now, um, why do we choose that? Well, we had non-randomized data from preparing relevant that 30 out of 40 intervals was better than 12 or 18. We had randomized data made at RIT saying 12 seconds better than two and a half seconds, advanced three, 30 is better than 18, and the St. Jude trial provide 25 better than 12. So we know that we can wait and we can do it safely. Uh, so we, uh, have two ways of doing it. We can provide, we can use a, a delay in time, or we can use a, a number of intervals. And the manufacturers differ on this, which is which is unfortunate. But 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 we can try and equate those things. And one of the things that people said was, I made an IRT trial, didn't really have a delay, just two and a half seconds beyond two hundred fifty beats per minute. But if you're having thirty intervals, you're actually delaying more than that. So what's the evidence, right? So there's direct evidence to support it. There's not uh, we don't have direct evidence to support a delay more than two and a half seconds for rates over 250 beats per minute, but we do have evidence that 30 intervals are safe. So we can infer that a time delay is reasonable. So we can't program 30 detection intervals for Boston devices, but we can program an equivalent delay. So here's just simply a table of how long it takes to detect these things. So if we take the 250 beat per minute mark, the Boston devices have an eight out of 10 interval 
detection window. So it takes about two seconds for that to occur. If you've got a Medtronic and Due device and you want 30 intervals, it's going to take around about seven seconds to, um, to detect those 30 intervals, right? So in order to approximate a time delay of 30, that 30 intervals gets you, you can add to your two seconds about a five second delay. And it turns out that as you get faster, because the intervals change very little as you get faster, it's four and a half seconds. So similar to five seconds. So that's why we chose uh, an additional five second delay uh, in those patients. Uh, and I'll show you the, at the very end how that translates to a manufacturer specific guideline. Uh, for primary prevention ICD patients, um, we, we, we wanted to give a, you know, at, at what rate should you intervene? Should it be 170? Should it be 200? What should it be? So we decided that the slowest tachycardia therapy zone limit should be starting between around 185 and 200 beats per minute, right? Now, if you've got a younger patient or, um, you know, you can't just reliably distinguish SVT from BT, you might want to put that rate a bit higher, but you want to make sure there's no clinical BT existing below that rate. So this is uh, why we chose this data. So we had some non-randomized data from Advanced 3. Now Advanced 3 was a randomized trial, but this was not a randomized parameter, right? So effectively it becomes like a registry data. Uh, 188 beats per minute, we know is good. The randomized data really just comes from made at RIT, which you know we've shown that shows a superiority of more than 200 beats per minute for a rate cut off over 170. And that showed less inappropriate shock and less mortality, right? So we know that 200 is good, and we know that around 188 is safe. So hence, 185 to 200 uh, for a starting point for kicking in for therapies. What about secondary prevention ICDs? Well, many secondary prevention ICDs, you've got to think about this, many of them turn up with VF, you don't know what the VT rate is. So you have to treat them pretty much as the primary prevention patients. But if you do happen to know what their VT rate is, it's reasonable to program the slowest tachycardia rate a zone to at least 10 beats per minute below the documented tachycardia. So they come in with a, with a tachycardia of 180, you want to take it to 170, or roughly that. Uh, now, the, this is a 2A recommendation, so we, we thought it was reasonable to do so, and the level of evidence here is a, a CEO. Now, when you're writing guidelines, you start to be a little bit suspicious of CEO guidelines, and I tell you how this happens, and this is a little bit unfortunate. So uh, what is the re reference here? So in the text of the document, it says previously published recommendations suggest a VT zone starting at 10 to 20 beats per minute slower than that observed tachycardia rate, uh, reference 31. What is reference 31? Well, I'm sorry to inform you that the expert opinion we're talking about here is me and my fellow, Matt Weber, who's now working in Wellington. Uh, and and uh, we wrote a recommendation for the program of implantable defibrillators in New Zealand. Uh, and we made it up. Uh, we made it up on what we thought was best practice and uh, no one's disagreed with us so far. But I think you have to be suspicious of expert opinion because one day uh, it might turn out that you're the expert and uh, you, you've got to be careful what you publish. All right, so um, I want to move on from uh, detection um, uh, rate and detection intervals or timing and talk about SVT discriminators. So in general, SV discriminators have come a long way and they're generally reliable. And what we said in this thing was, uh, you know, looking at some sparse randomized data, we gave a class one recommendation that uh, we should include, we should put SVT discriminators on for rhythms with rates faster than 200. So, you, so SVT discriminators, you can be pretty confident up to 200 beats per minute, they're gonna do well, but potentially up to 230 beats per minute, uh, unless it's contraindicated, to reduce the inappropriate therapies. Now, the contraindications is unfortunately pretty lengthy. I mean, basically, if the patient's in complete heart block, you want to turn these things off. They're not going to get an SVT, right? I think people forget that. Uh, but if the patient's in complete heart block, turn them off. Uh, but, you know, you've got to think about where the atrial lead's going to dis dislodge. Um, and if you've got atrial undersensing or oversensing of far field R waves or permanent AF, again, you know, you want to turn off the dual chamber discriminator. So a little bit of thought maybe about whether the patient's going to benefit from this or whether it's just all downside. What are SV discriminators? Well, there's a number of them. So there's onset discriminators, that's either sudden onset, which are available in pretty much all defibrillators. Some manufacturers have this chamber of onset feature, which is quite interesting. This is a one-time discriminator. Onset only happens once, so I have to be a little bit careful about this. I'll talk about that later. Interval stability. This is really trying to distinguish atrial fibrillation where the intervals are unstable versus monomorphic BT where they're generally stable. Then there's the dual chamber algorithms, right? So straight up, off the bat, 
uh, if the V is greater than the A, that's going to confirm VT in about 80% of patients. Great, great discriminator. Is there AV dissociation? If so, you know, maybe there's sinus tachycardia with an isorhythmic VT. Is there AV association? And if you've got N to one AV association, it might be a flutter. Uh, and I think you can use these uh, algorithms to work around it. But more recently, the morphology is an increasingly important algorithm in modern ICD. So as you're probably aware, they look at sinus rhythm or atrial fibrillation or whatever's normal for the patient and get a template of what it's supposed to look like. And if it looks the same when it's going fast, it's probably an SVT. If it looks different when it's going fast, it's probably a VT. Bearing in mind that, of course, people can develop rate-related bundle branch block and it can be difficult. But these are increasingly important algorithms in modern ICDs. But I think one of the SVT discriminators that we really don't give enough credit for is the rate. Rate in itself is a very good discriminator. So higher rates are likely to be VT and less likely to be SVT. So the higher we set the rate, we're also giving a discriminator as well. And I think people forget about that a little bit uh, when they're programming. So what's the data to support the SVD discriminators? Well, we've got registry data. If you've got SVD discriminators on in a 100,000 patient database, you've got a 17% reduction in shocks. It's registry data. There might be good reasons why they're off or on, but that's, uh, we know that we can reduce it. Well, we know that these patients have reduced for whatever reason they have it on. Uh, if you were, so SCUDHEF didn't have SVD discriminators. Early trial didn't use them. It's been estimated by computer modeling that you could reduce shocks by um, more than 75% if you had turned them on in that trial. And what about the underdetection of VT? So, um, you know, you, you'd be worried that if you put SVD discriminators, you're going to let VT go on treatment. But it's actually very rare with modern programming. And one of the things to talk about, all those trials I talk about, the Advanced 3, the MADITS, the PREPARES, the, the, strip, the syncope is actually pretty rare. One of the important things is when you're putting therapy reduction is you want to make sure you can reduce therapy, but you're doing it safely. And it turns out syncope is not common. And just one other mention again about those once-only strategies. So you've got onset, it's applied once, uh, and you could, if, you, if you're applying it once um, and you're withholding therapy on a one-time discriminator one of, uh, compared to those like stability or, or morphology, which constantly reevaluate, um, I, I kind of think it's the one possibility where if you're only using onset, you maybe want to pay it at some sort of sustained rate duration um, on. Uh, and what rate are we talking about? So we've got good data from Papier Empirical Mated RAT that empirical programming up to 200 beats per minute is good. And the, even some, we've got data from Mated, R, Mated 2 that, you know, about half of those SVT episodes are faster than 170 for a start, but a few get right up to 250 beats per minute. So is it safe to program them up that way? And we know that, you know, you've got about 20% of uh, SVTs, um, SVTs comprise 20% of episodes between 200 and 250, and there's data from the pain-free SST trial that supports programming SV discriminators up to around about 222 or even 230 beats per minute. And so that was reflected in the way we wrote the programming was that we suggest the SVT limit not exceed 230 beats per minute, right? So, you, um, so you're good to go up to 300 definitely, and you're probably good to go to 230. Beyond 230, you've really got to have a patient-specific uh, indication because we just don't want to misclassify those really, really fast, unstable VTs. All right, I'm going to move on to tachycardia therapy. And to introduce that, I'm going to show you this old trial that, that you know, 2004. This is the pain free uh, 2 trial, uh, which essentially had a shock arm and an ATP arm. And you'll remember probably this trial showed ATP success in 70% of patients. So these patients got shocked 20% of the time, these patients got shocked 60, 70% of the time for any given uh, arrhythmia. But one of the things I'd like to show about this is not only to reinforce that ATP works, is look at the spontaneous termination rate, 30%. 30% spontaneous terminated in the shock arm versus the ATP arm. Why? Well, if you make a tachycardia detection and you put ATP on, the ATP happens immediately. If you're in the shock arm, you have to charge the device. That takes a number of seconds, and that allows the spontaneous termination of malignant arrhythmias, right? So even just waiting a little bit for the device to charge gets you spontaneous termination in a significant proportion. Right, so moving to tachycardia therapy programming recommendations, we've got class one level evidence A, patients with structural heart disease, and I guess the way we wrote this was say, you know, maybe not the long QTs or the brigadas, maybe, uh, 
should have ATP therapy active for all ventricular tick arrhythmic zones um, up to 230 beats per minute uh, to reduce total shocks, right? So up to 230, we think a patient should have uh, ATP therapy active. Uh, all patients should have at least one ATP attempt, at least one, uh, with a minimum of eight stimuli cycle length around the mid 80s percent of the tachycardia cycle length. <clears throat> we thought that burst ATP therapy had better evidence than ramp ATP therapy because that improves the termination rate of the ventricular arrhythmias. This is from a, you know, just a, a one trial. And we also had some uh, device therapy that we thought supported the activation of shock therapy to all therapy zones. Obviously not a monitor zone, but if you've got a therapy zone, there should be some shock therapy. However, there was a strong feeling from a minority of people, which I, to be honest, in retrospect, I think was right, that really to limit patient discomfort and anxiety, if you've got a patient with hemodynamically stable, slow VT, you can, be, you can put treatments in, ATP treatments in general, without a programming of backup shock. So the patient's got a stable VT at 170 beats per minute, they turn up to hospital with it, you want to have a crack at it with the um, ATP, but you may not necessarily want to give them uh, a shock because um, they're actually tolerating it fine. So there is the option of doing that, but otherwise, uh, all shock therapy to all therapy zones. And the initial shock energy should be a maximum in that highest rate detection zone, unless you've got specific defibrillation testing to demonstrating efficacy at lower energy. So if you're a DFT tester and you've, just, you've shown that VF terminates with a lower energy, fine, go with that. But otherwise, you want maximum energy in the highest rate detection zone. And then the next question is, you know, can we go further with these patients? You know, could we delay further? Could we wait longer? Could we let more, uh, you know, even faster VTs be untreated? So there's some data, right? So 7 out of secondary prevention patients, 18 out of 24 versus 30 out of 40, resulted in reduced VF threat episodes. Um, so uh, 270 ICD patients with the increased detection zones. So um, they, they put not only uh, longer number of intervals to detect, 30, but also concomitantly, because most of the trials have been one or the other, but concomitantly greater than 200 beats per minute and resulted in 86% reduction in inappropriate therapy. You've got registry data here uh, where a quarter of the patients actually had their detection rate more than 220 beats per minute. And in that subsection of patients, they had a 60% reduction in appropriate therapy uh, and a 60% reduction in inappropriate therapy. And then we've got a small trial here where they said, well, if 30 out of 40 is good for you, how much better would 60 out of 80 be? <laughs> and, uh, and showed a 10% reduction in unnecessary therapy. And I think this terminology is important too, because you have appropriate therapy, you have inappropriate therapy, but some appropriate therapy may be unnecessary because if you let it go longer, it was never going to keep going and it was never going to threaten the patient. So I think inappropriate, appropriate, together become unnecessary for a proportion of the appropriates. And this uh, brings me on to the manufacturer specific guidelines. So this is what Alejandro uh, alluded to in his introductions. You know, to be honest, this is what I wanted to do from the start is put some manufacturer specific guidelines out there so that whether you live in Buenos Aires, Cape Town, Birmingham, or Vancouver, you can, you're not familiar with say uh, a biotronic ICD, somebody turns up to your clinic with it, you can look up this document and it, it uses the specific terms that the manufacturer uses and it tells you how to program it. Um, and, and also you can potentially even set default settings. So you can do this with some programmers. You can say international ICD expert consensus guidelines, push the button and the device simply gets those um, instructions uh, rather than um, having the man, you know, the human error associated with people doing it, you know, feature by feature. So our ICD programming recommendations uh, give you class and level of evidence. They're carefully worded statements, they guide therapy, but gener are generic to programming. But there are five manufacturers of ICDs that uh, worldwide, there's very, very few, few niche ones around the world, but five major manufacturers, they all have their own terminology, they have different detection algorithms, therapy discriminators, features, and it becomes a bit of a minefield, you know, I find it very difficult to keep up. 
And so the aim of the manufacturer took the recommendations was to make the programming according to consensus statement easy. So in order to get these manufacturer specific guidelines out there, they had to write a consensus statement and then use that consensus statement to sort of generate the manufacturer specific guidelines. So I think the next slide is actually conclusion slides, but it's not the end. Um, so um, uh, I just know the one after. So, and we then not only do we have Appendix B, which were these uh, manufacturers with the guidelines, but actually last year we revised them. In fact, it was from 2018 onwards. And this was actually a big, big thing because I had to work with all manufacturers to try and get this, you know, passed. Uh, and so we did a focused update in 2019 because we recognize that ICDs are evolving with additional features. And my idea was this would be some sort of living document that would be, you know, your new, new device out with some feature would be able to, it, it doesn't, it's not as simple as that it turns out, but at least we were, we've updated it once. There were some anecdotal reports of patients who were being programmed to Appendix B recommendations not being effectively treated, some of whom had died. Uh, and so we, we thought it was appropriate to say, well, you know, have we got this wrong? Um, and, but what we didn't do is we didn't change the 2015 recommendations. The 2015 recommendations stand, but we adapted the manufacturer specific settings to ensure that we were still applying those recommendations, but applying them in a safe fashion with industry consultation. And I think it's worth noting that two things. Patients who do not receive um, unnecessary ICD therapy, so they, they were, would have got an appropriate shock or an appropriate shock, if they don't get it, they're not aware of being spared potential harm. It's a bit like the patient that you start uh, anticoagulation on for their atrial fibrillation doesn't come and thank you for the stroke they didn't have last week. They come and blame you for the bleed that you gave them and ended up in intensive care, but they don't thank you for the stroke they didn't have, right? So these patients are un unaware that they didn't get unnecessary ICD therapy. On the other hand, the patients in whom the ICD failed to treat their life-threatening arrhythmias, they have their event recorded in painstaking detail because you can interrogate the device and it basically tells you, oh, if you'd shot them after 24 beats rather than 30, this patient would still be alive, All right? So that's kind of a difficult thing to quantify and reconcile. But I'll take you back to the fact that therapy reduction strategies have been shown to reduce mortality, right? So despite reports of harm to a few, there must be, because we know the data, a greater benefit to most. And that's really what we're trying to hang our hat on with these guidelines. So premature conclusion slide, the aim of optimal ICD programming is to improve patient outcomes. So where there's data, we tried to come up with solid recommendations. Where data was scarce, we made some logical deductions and used expert opinion to fill in the gaps. And the idea is our, it's, it's a best effort to provide guidance. So you know, had a review process which highlighted the need for additional recommendations. And the aim was to preview, improve the safety of ICDs, reduce the morbidity and mortality of the patients who live with these devices every day. So I'm gonna make a, a, a sort of a halfway conclusion there, but I do have some data following this on the recommendations for um, uh, manufacturer specific, but maybe it's a good point here, Alejandro, to just pause for a bit and answer questions if people have them, or I can just carry on if would people. Yeah, like. so so um, Martin, yeah, it's a, you know it's a very comprehensive document, um, and you know might be a bit daunting at first glance to say you know I'm gonna I'm gonna read this, but it's actually I've I found it to be a very useful document when you have you know specific questions regarding programming because I think most of us in practice have a general understanding of, you know, primary prevention programming uh, based on, I think the most notorious trial is the MADID RIT, it's the one that's, that most people quote, but there are obviously other trials as you quoted that have interesting data. And one of the things that I always thought about is, you know, this is an evolving topic based on the fact that more data is gonna come out, but also that um, you know, devices are going to change, and I was going to say that, as you said, you know, this should be a living document. You you should think of this as sort of a, you know, think of the Long QT web page, right? The Credible Meds web page used to be called QTC Drugs. Now it's Credible Meds, and it's evolving. You know, it changes. New drugs come out. They get put in there. There should be maybe a motion 
to discuss within you know the different societies that participated to maybe have a, a website a repository of this information as it comes out and people may be commissioned to update it on a regular basis because i think it's very useful data um, one one topic that i've always thought about is um, you know reduction in icd shocks and how it uh, transpires into reduced mortality. What is the mechanism? You know, I remember uh, a number of years ago, there was a thought that, you know, shocks cause myocardial injury. And so troponin leak was directly related to increased mortality because of the shocks. We did a study in Wellington, I think it was a small study, but we, we used to do deferred BFT testing because we didn't have anesthesia always available. And we used to be DFT testers back in the day. Scott Harding and I used to pretty much DFT everyone. But many of the patients with DFT, you know, as a second procedure. And so what we did is we looked at the troponin values at the time of implant. And we compare those who had ICD testing at the time of implant and those who had ICD testing deferred. What we found out is that the troponin levels were elevated not by virtue of the testing, not by virtue of the shock, but by virtue of the direct myocardial injury of the lead place. So right. the troponin levels were elevated when we implanted the lead, but not when we tested without implanting the lead. So I don't really know what drives the reduction in the mortality. I don't know what your thoughts are on this. Yeah, I, and I, I don't know either. Um, I don't know if anybody does, but this is important when you're talking about things like subcutaneous ICDs, because most of us will say, well, look, ATP is fabulous. Um, you know, it's painless, it saves battery, and it's effective, and it doesn't shock the patient. But you've got the subcutaneous ICD, which just simply shocks the patient. Mm -hmm. And so the people from Boston have been very keen to, to, to say, well, shocks aren't bad. Um, and, you know, um, I, I think there's, you know, the data's fraught because a lot of it's registry stuff, and the reason people are having shocks may be because of the severity of the disease, right? Mm -hmm. It but could when you be got a surrogate right? of severe disease, you know, more people yeah. with more severe disease, worse cardiomyopathy, more arrhythmia substrates are going to have more shocks. And so maybe, maybe yeah. that's but when you put the randomized trial data saying, well, actually just randomize one to more shocks or less shocks is effectively what you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it's fascinating. And it, it may be a psychological impact of the shocks. It can't be underestimated. Um, maybe it is what we do when we get the shocks, maybe because they come in with a shock and we alter their therapy, we're somehow harming them mm -hmm. i don't right. know um and what just to go back on what you're talking about updating this document aleandra if you want to do it you're welcome to do it <laughs> <laughs> it's a nightmare yeah. can i just tell you we spent it's daunting think, yeah it should have been the update of 2018 it was the update of 2019 because you know we're talking to boston we're talking to biotronic boston are saying you know you can't do this you got to put in this extra thing we eventually said yeah fine um you know i we had people on the call saying, you can't do this. You are killing patients. I can't believe you'd want to program it like that. You know, this is a sort of little discussion we're having. Right. It was quite stressful. I know that people in Biotronic, they didn't engage at the start. And there were some people who basically got redeployed to other parts of the company because of it. Right. Um, you know, it was a nightmare. So yeah, um, I don't think it's going to be me, but it, it's a laudable aim. Um, um, food for thought. Maybe yeah. someone will want to champion it. Good. Um, so do you want me to move on? Shall I just, yeah, why, don't we, why don't we keep going and then we'll get more questions as we go along. Okay, cool. Uh, so let me just get back on there. Yeah, we go. Cool. So this is the latest version. This is the 2019 guidelines. Um, I've just put the PubMed ID down in the corner here because what I'd like to see, uh, you know, in my head, what happens is people look up the document, they print out the five pages and they stick them on the wall of their pacemaker clinic. Um, because you know you can ref you can refer to them very easily. Uh, I hope that's what's happening around the world. I don't know. Maybe people are ignoring it. But uh, this is what the whole aim was, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the, I'm going to go through the devices. So the Abbott formerly St Jude. So what you're going to say is you're going to have you've got these zones that are called BF, BDT2, and VT. You're going to have patients with no VT history. We didn't say primary prevention and secondary prevention. We said VT history, right? So that's all. No VT history is primary prevention and a good deal of your secondary preventions because you just don't know what the VT is because you by the time you shock them they're in BF. So you pro program 30 intervals at either 240 or 250 beats per minute. Just incidentally, the asterisks here are um, 
uh, where they're not nominal, just so people know what's nominal. These are not nominal, so you actually have to make the effort. And one of the things I'd like to see happen is that the companies change their nominal, change their nominal settings. You know, why do we, they come out of shock boxes? And if you're a, you know, cardiothoracic surgeon with not much information about ICDs and you're putting ICDs in, you're not going to change it. So the, I think that default settings are really important. Anyway, so you're going to go 240, 250 for the BF zone. You're going to go 187 for the BT2 zone. 187 is a valid choice in St. Jude. They don't have 188. It's just some minor things like this are important. Um, and, you go, and you're going to put on a monitor zone if you wish. If you know what the cycle length is, you're going to have the BT zone here at the same, the BF zone at the same. Your BT2 zone is going to be from 187 or 10 to 20 beats per minute below what you know the BT rate is. And the other zone is going to be um, uh, a monitor zone, or perhaps this is the zone that's going to capture the VT that you know, and this is going to because it's slow, and the VT2 zone is going to be 187. There's a few footnotes here. Um, you know, the thing about the Abbott devices, where we had a lot of discussion, was is that the way they work is that they bin these things. So if you if there's an interval in the VF zone, it gets bin to VF. But there's an interval in the VT zone, two zone, it gets bin to VT2. And if you're straddling the zone and you've got 30 intervals and you have 29 in VF zone and 29 in the VT zone, you've got a 58 interval VT, but you haven't reached detection yet. Right? So effectively, you can double the time to detect. And also, if you miss a B, a poor sensing or something, sometimes if you fall out of the zone, you can reset the counters, right? So if you've got poor sensing, you should have fewer detection intervals. So there's a few caveats that we wanted to put in there because if you don't know much about what you, you know, if you're not familiar with the devices or, or you're just new to the field, you just don't understand this little subtle stuff. Biotronic, similar story, 30 out of 40. If programmable, some of the devices, the maximum is 24 out of 30. Uh, at 230 beats per minute. Why 230 beats per minute? Because in Biotronic, the SVT discriminators are linked to the detection zone. So if you make that 250, and this is 188, effectively 188 to 250, and you've got SVT discriminators on, then you're going to have SC discriminators all the way to 250, which we don't think is necessarily safe. So in this case, you're going to put your, um, your VF zone at 230 and above, your VT zone at 188 to 230, um, and they're going to have 30 intervals. If you really want a, 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 to, to do it differently, uh, you can have VF from 250, discriminators off for VT2 for 230, and discriminators on for VT1 from 188, but you can't get a monitor zone. And that's useful, particularly for the discriminators, and if you want more than one ATP a team, because I've got the one shot um, for uh, VT, but if you want, you know, so there's a, a couple of options there for the patients. It gets a bit complex, but you know, that's how it goes, right? Boston, we changed it from 2015 to 2019. We gave them both made it IT, IT interval. In the first version, we gave just a delayed therapy one because that's the way we did it. Now, we're going to use uh, for the delayed therapy, eight out of 10 intervals takes a couple of seconds, plus a five second delay, or duration they call it, for the 250 and above, right? From 185, we're going to use 12 seconds. We've got the meta IT uh, data that shows that 12 seconds is good up to 250, right? And then you've got a monitor zone underneath if you wish. Or you can go high rate. Simply 8 out of 10, 2.5 second duration, 200 beats per minute, exactly like the high rate therapy arm of meta IT, right? And then you've got this other stuff if you know, happen to know what the VT cycle length is. Um, and sorry, that just to remind you, why, what, why 5 seconds? Well, 2 plus 5 equals 7 because we're trying to replicate the 30 intervals from the other trials. It's not ideal, but I think it's reasonable. Um, right, Medtronic, uh, probably the simplest. Uh, they had quite a lot of trials, the advanced three, you know, the prepare trials. So um, you can actually go single zone uh, because if you go VF from 188 with 30 to 40 intervals, um, Basically, you know, uh, you don't need the fast VT on because the use of ATP before or during charging the VF zone achieves similar functionality as if you use the fast VT zone, right? But if you want to go to multi-zone programming using the fast VT zone, then you can get tiered, tiered ATP therapy. Say you want to give three bursts or, or more, you can do that if you've got multi-tiered multi, multi -tiered, um, therapy. But otherwise, this is actually pretty simple. And we're trying to be very keen on on preserving the simplicity, which you can understand. Uh, just one other footnote here is, is the VT zone in the Medtronic devices 
is a consecutive count, right? So you got to have consecutive one drops out, you're back to zero. So um, we had data from the pain-free SST trial to suggest that 24 intervals was safe, but not beyond. So hence the slight difference there. Microport CRM, I don't know whether this is, uh, this people are using this much. Uh, it's in Australia, we don't use it in New Zealand. We have the occasional patient who's migrated. Um, they have a different, the Siren devices were different, right? What they basically said in Siren is, we're gonna record every VT, we're gonna take every VT, and we're gonna let our SVT discriminators sort it out. That's a you know, laudable aim, actually pretty good. Um, but if you wanted to program it as the device of, of, about the evidence that we had, then you had to go with a similar type of programming, right? And uh, they didn't have their own, their, own, their own data, really, to the extent that the other companies had. So therefore, we were stuck with this, right? So similar rate in here, 255. Um, you've got the six out of eight majority, but like the Austin devices, but you can add another few cycles. So you can add 20 cycles to approximate 30 cycles. Right, and then you can uh, put your tier zones in. So again, SVT, SVT discriminators linked to zones. So uh, this is why the 230 here and the 185 here, and they've got an extra zone here, which you can use as a monitor zone, a four zone device. Um, and the VT rate 10, 10 to 20 beats below. And then, um, and the SV discriminators, I'm not gonna show you all of them because the thing about the SV discriminators, if anything is manufacturer specific, it's these things. Uh, and this is probably the more complex uh, one. Um, uh, this is the Sajoo one, I think. Yeah, I think it's the Sajoo one. So, um, so you know, single chamber morphology on, um, and they recommend that the other ones, which I think are stability onset, such like, are for passive. So, passive means that you would see what they it records it. You would see what it would have decided had it been asked to participate, but it doesn't participate, uh, and that means that you may be able to get useful information to put them on later. Uh, dual chambers and CRTDs, um, you, you know, you can put these things on. Um, and then I think the other thing you had to think about is for CRT is that for the morphology, you've got to think about what the template is because you don't want to be the template isn't the paste beat, it's the intrinsic beat, right? So you've got to think about that. You can turn off the auto update. That's probably the easiest thing to do. Or, um, you know, you've got to make sure the template pasting hysteresis is on. So it drops the rate, see what the intrinsic's doing, uses that for its template, and then carries on with the CRT pacing. And then you've got your upper limits at 2.30. We're saying we're going to trust these discriminators because they're good, so we're going to put the timeout off uh, and and as with the BT therapy timeout. And, and the other ones are, uh, are, you know, specific to each, each programming. Uh, one last thing on the subcutaneous ICD, because this is really a game changer in terms of the way of how we think about things. This is a very simple device. So you've got four things to program. You can turn it on, you can turn it off. You can set the shock zone rate, okay? So this is just gonna shock the patient if you're in this range. There is a conditional zone. You can think about the conditional zone as like an SVT discriminator on zone, right? And that can be from 170 to 240, but it's got to be more than at least 10 beats per, per minute lower than the shock zone, right? And then you can turn on or off post shock pacing. Easy. And there are some non-programmable parameters. The outputs are stuck at 80 joules. The detection is 8 out of 20, 18 out of 24. But if you get non-sustained VT a lot, it does 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 um, you know if it realizes that you're getting a lot of stuff in the sort of 16 beat range, uh, it's going to extend that out because it knows that you're a self terminator. And the conditional zone is just a stepwise discrimination algorithm. It's very clever. Uh, a very amazing engineering gone into that. Um, and so if you classify it as a non-arrhythmic oversensing or an SVT, you withhold therapy in that conditional zone. So um, we said in the original paper 2015 for the subcutaneous ICD, reasonable to program two tachycardia detection zones, one with the tachycardia discrimination algorithms, that's the, the conditional zone from a rate of around 200, and a second zone without those on, like a shock box from 230. Uh, People argued for 220, certainly Boston did, but we thought 230 uh, was reasonable. So shock zone 230 and above, conditional zone from um, uh, 200 or a little less if you know what the VT cycle length is. And we felt that post-shock pacing was probably a good thing to do, which just goes to 30 seconds. Because we know that there's a lot better basis to leave it happen sometimes. I think that's us. Yeah, back to my conclusion slide. Um, I think if you are interested in this field, you know, downloading and keeping them somewhere on the computer or on the wall 
is a useful thing to do for the um, for the manufacturers that you use. And in fact, for the ones that you don't, just in case, you know, people travel, don't they? Well, they used to. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Alejandro. Yeah, thank, thank you, Martin. I, I have to say, I, I agree with you. This, this is, you know, one of the take, take home points of this talk is, you know, there's a lot of data in the document, having it handy and having your, you know, device techs, having it in the device clinic is very useful. Having it in the operating theater, you know, where you implant your devices is very useful as well because there's a lot of nuisances and a lot of different ways that all these devices think. I mean, they all, you could say that they all do the same, but they, the way they go about doing their, doing their thing is a bit different. So, oh, and sometimes the devil is in the details, you know, um, these, this is a very thoughtful um, uh, document. I know you, you and everyone else that participated in it spend a lot of time looking at all the nuisances and uh, different algorithms of each company. And there was close communication with the device companies regarding how things work and how you could you know, maximize the use of each particular device and then trying to simplify it to a, you know, a uh, relatively straightforward way of um, programming, I think, is the key to this. Um, I had a few notes. Um, so from the first part of the talk, you were talking about, you know, the noise algorithms um, to withhold shocks. Um, and I think it was given, a, a le uh, you know, a 2B level recommendation. Um, was there a strong feeling about it being a 2B or were people... Yeah, I mean, I think, it, yeah, so there's, there's, two, there's two levels to this, right? For mm -hmm. these noise algorithm things, there are the ones that's, that, that alert you to a problem right. by their home monitoring or whenever you see them, and there are the ones that withhold therapy. And that's quite different, right? Yeah, one of them, of course. Yeah, one of them's just a kind of a, you know, heads up, and the other one is, well, actually, we can trust this thing sufficiently. We're going to withhold therapy. Okay. So there were two. So we gave the stronger recommendations to those that were the heads up because what's the harm, right? Somebody's mm -hmm. sensible looking at it. But the ones that actually withhold therapy was a different story. So we gave them a weaker recommendation. Um, and uh, But, you know, I think what's happened with the Riata leads and what was the Medtronic one we had problems with? That's um, Fidelis. Yeah, that's the one. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, th that, you know, what these have taught us is that, that you know, we can't, the leads are the weak point, really, aren't they? Yeah, there was, there was another lead. There was a Biotronic lead. I think it was the Linux lead, one of the Linux leads, who had some issues as well. Never never made it to an advisory, but I remember seeing a lot of patients with noise on those leads. We actually did a couple of extractions and and replacement of those leads in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So... Um, you know what it's like. You did identify leads. You think you identify a trend, and you go back to the company and you say, "Look, we think there's something wrong." And they're like, "No, no, what, what problem? There's no problem." <laughs> yeah, and that um, was one that we always thought should have been raised as more than just an advisory. But um, anyway, yeah. um, and then you know the other question that comes to mind is regarding you know the different forms of ATP. You know, you can get really elaborate with this. You know, and depending yeah, on the can. device. You can do burst ramp scan. You can change the scan decrement. You know, there's a number of things you can do. And I, and I know that in the interest of the document, things should have stayed as, simpler, as simple as possible. And I, I, from my understanding, I know that ramp tends to have more incidence of inducing VF, you know, generating a, a stable monomorphic tachycardia into a into a, a you know polymorphic or pleomorphic tachycardia and the bursts um, seem to be more less likely to cause that. Um, was there any significant difference between the burst algorithms across the Yeah there was I mean I you know it's a bit tricky maybe asking uh, but I think it was it was the Pythagora Pythagora trial or something mm -hmm. like that right where it showed burst was better than ramp. Yeah. There's not a lot of data, mm -hmm. and there's people doing crazy stuff. You know, there's people saying, "Well, you know, maybe 15 beats is better than eight, or so." Or, yeah. You know, there's all sorts of things, and 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 the, and the the combinations are almost unlimited. You know, and it's one of the things I like about the subcutaneous ICD. You know, you know, just a, you don't have to a, think about it. You it's just... a device for surgeons, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a question. Uh, sorry, from... I'm sorry for this, any surgeon, um, but you know, I don't think so. But if there is, yes, we it's it's no pun intended. 
Yeah, yeah, it is nice. So look, we've got a, a Zoom, a, a group chat mention. Uh, any special recommend yes. reprogramming for VT causing syncope when it was set to similar guidelines prior to the episode? Right, yeah, so I guess, I mean, it's really important to say that these are recommendations, they're guidelines, and they're not a, um, a, a substitution for common sense, right? And we, we have this, also this thing, you know, we have a patient comes for a box change, put it in 2013, and they've been doing fine with the settings that they have, right? So do you then say, hey, we know better now, we're gonna do this, and maybe if they've had no shocks, or any therapy, it's probably reasonable to do so, right? But if the shocks, the settings that they've got is working, I kind of think, well, if it ain't broke, why change it? Yeah. So, yeah, we have this discussion with our pacemaker clinic anytime, you know, every time well, somebody's come from another country, another region of the country, and they've got different settings, do you want to get it to local settings? And the question really becomes, well, are they having useful therapy? If so, let's continue it. If they're not having useful therapy, uh, or it's been a problem, then maybe we should, we can be better because we've got the, the data. And I think one of the temptations here is to say, well, we're smarter than the empiric program. What the empiric trial told us is that physicians are not smarter. The empiric programming is actually better than people thinking about it because they think they're better and they're not. That's right. Um, and then do you, do you know of any data on uh, adherence to these guidelines? Do you have any data in New Zealand? Oh, actually, do you know what, Alejandro, I do. And it's pretty disappointing, actually, uh, you know, um, so there's a, um, what's, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the registry. I think the, the Boston registry is a very large registry, mainly states based. And they looked at the way things were programming and they looked mm -hmm. at made it IRT coming out and there was a bump in how people mm -hmm. were programming. And then they looked at the 2015 guidelines and there was a mini bump. Mm -hmm. um, so you're a long, long, long way to go. Long way to go. I, I don't know about the 2019 guidelines. I'm hoping there's a better, a larger bump. I think it's a bit yeah. easy to find on the web. Um, now it actually got published in a few journals rather than actually previously appendix B was existed solely online. Now there's actually paper versions of this thing. And I, I mean, you'd think to be these days online would be good enough, but certainly, certainly not. Yeah. Um, yeah. So disappointing, but this is why I want the companies to start changing their defaults. Right. So, so, so the, the more likely, you know, if the companies adhere to the, to the evidence base, right? Because this is evidence-based recommendation yeah. with a combination of, you know, stronger studies, maybe some um, more descriptive studies, but a, a lot of thought process from a lot of experts in the field. Um, then obviously, you know, a lot. Of, I think a lot of people implant out of the box. I, I, I yeah. see. At yeah. least I, think they, I think there's data to, to, to support that. And yeah. the other thing is that you know. You know, the Sintu guys or Abbott guys are not going to program on the basis of a mitron trial. They're just not doing it. It's a really interesting process for me to, 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 to engage with the, the companies and look at how differently they see things from us. They're very risk averse, right? right. Yeah. This idea that if you're programming something and the patient dies because of the programming choices you made, you can see it all lined out, right? Put yeah. that on a course law. Your Honor, I put to you that the patient would still be alive if you hadn't programmed it this way, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, or, but the benefits there by withholding therapy. So it's really hard, really hard. Yeah, and we had yeah. some strong discussions. I can tell you, I wish I'd recorded them though. Yeah. You should have zoomed them and recorded them. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I can, I can imagine the level of cause, cause you know, you're talking about, you're not just talking about patient care, but potentially talking about, you know, financial implications you know litigation yeah. and all and all that litigation stuff. yeah yeah and look in new zealand we forget that because we have a litigation we, we have very few litigation and in the yeah, states i yeah. imagine it's the opposite right yeah, it's completely so, different um, and within states in in the states it's also different and right and people right. have different ways of seeing things but yeah uh, no, we, you know this is i've since since i i remember matt showing me the you know, the New Zealand consensus. And we discussed it at one of the Heart Rhythm New Zealand uh, meetings. And, and we at Wellington said, okay, well, let, let, let's adopt them and let's try to, you know, get with the guidelines sort of thing. Um, we actually saw, at least in my view, I saw that um, by having a uniform programming scheme, you know, it was simple, effective, and made, made 
our lives a lot easier. So I always it's, yeah, that's true. I think uh, you know if you just uh, yeah, if you don't have to think about it every time, because you know what it's like. You just put the device and you're unscrubbing, you're taking your gloves off, and you don't reinvent program. the wheel. You know you're not you you know you're doing the right programming. Obviously, each patient is different, and you have to individualize um, patient care. But it, it's it's you know again, this is taking into account variations in devices, variations in indication, primary versus secondary. And it's taking into consideration the knowledge of the previous VTs um, mm -hmm. and uh, the potential pros and cons and the programming. So, uh, you yeah. know, I, uh, I have to advocate for using these guidelines. If any of the people that are listening to this talk have not, you know, looked at this document, I highly recommend that we do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post a, you know, Twitter follow-up with, with the document link so that people can look yeah, at it. That'd be great. Um, probably the, with the 2019 guidelines. Yeah. Yeah. With the update. Yeah. With the, with the 2019. The paper itself is pretty dry. Right. Um, right. Anything yeah, else, uh, Martin? will be in clinic. Uh, it's 11 o'clock in the morning here and uh, yeah. I got work to do. Yeah. Well, I've, I've got to get home, pick up groceries and stuff. And uh, I want to thank Martin for, you know, giving us his uh, input on this important topic and to everyone that participated. I'm going to post a talk on Zoom, on uh, on YouTube in the next few yep. days so that people that couldn't join can benefit from um, this very interesting discussion. So thanks a lot, Martin, and uh, no problem. see you soon, okay? Yeah. Good luck Thank with you your much. patient. Yeah, yeah. Right. thanks. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye, everyone.